Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Markowski. Welcome to my studio. Today, we are going to recreate a composite image which I created uh, to celebrate the the 46th anniversary of the launch of Voyager 1, uh, which occurred just about a week after the launch of Voyager 2, ironically, paradoxically. Um, this is something that's fascinated me for a long time. The whole, um, well, space in general, as some of you know, one of my goals in life is to go to the moon and make a painting. But... Uh, um, I don't know, maybe it all began with the Voyager spacecraft, which was launched just shortly before I was born, and um, the, the flybys of Jupiter and Saturn occurred when I was very young and was all over the news on the cover of National Geographic, um, if anybody remembers magazines, <laughs> physical magazines. Anyway, uh, I want to try to recreate this painting, and so let's, uh, let's get right to it. Um, this is the plan for today's episode. We're going to get the image on the canvas. I'll show you how to do that. We're going to stain it. We'll talk a little bit about the history of the Voyager program. Um, we'll look... Do we do maybe a little bit of underpainting? And then background, foreground, background, and ideally finish up in about three and a half, four hours, which is about typical for these episodes. Um, so just also as a quick little um, reminder to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, especially if you're watching for the first time, about 60 to 70% of people who watch these episodes are not yet subscribers. So doing that is super helpful. And if you want to support the channel with a small donation, as little as 25 cents, a dollar, $5 million, whatever you feel comfortable with, <laughs> that helps keep the lights on literally here. So let's, uh, let's go to our first step. Step. we're going to get the image onto the canvas and so one of the things so i created this image in photoshop this is an actual this is a digital um schematic of voyager from uh, nasa's website and then this is an actual image that voyager one took of saturn as it flew past it and i collage them together in Photoshop and then I took that file and imported it into my iPad Pro and using the Apple Pencil and the Procreate app I traced over those lines and that's what we have here now you could draw this out yourself but I'm going to trace it out and I'm probably going to do this in two steps maybe I'm not exactly sure how I want to go about doing this painting so let's just see. So if you want to get this um, this file, oh, like the the Facebook page, become a a, a member of our Facebook group um, because I want you to take a photograph of whatever you create today and upload it to the Facebook group. And in a couple of weeks, I'm going to do a free feedback episode where I celebrate all the great work on there and give free pointers on how you can get better as an artist, whether it's painting. Voyager 1 like I'm going to do today or something else you're working on including the drawing class which is hugely popular about 300,000 people have taken that class so that's all free you find the link in the description below and I'm still going through the the images that people send me as they do the drawing course and I would love to see what you do um, so anyway there's that here's the Dropbox link so for our paint the news course uh, you'll see we've done a, a number of space-related things because I'm interested in space. We've done Mars Perseverance rover. We did Alyssa Carson, the the young woman who wants to be an astronaut. We did an image of me painting on the moon. What else do we do? We did an uh, image of Chris Hatfield, the Canadian astronaut in the space station. We did Alouette 1, which was the first Canadian satellite. We did Canada Arm aboard the Space Shuttle Columbia. We did a, the McMinnville UFO, um, which is one, a very famous UFO crash. We did a U, the, or sorry, UFO sighting. We did the Roswell UFO crash. And now here in file number 30, we've got the files for Voyager 1. So you want to download the JPEG or PDF 
um, version here and print it out on your inkjet or laser jet printer at home. It will look like so there's that and then there's my outline right and then we're going to transfer that onto the canvas right now and look there's deborah goodman and kathy in the chat saying hello goodman says hello mr markowski how was your day <laughs> it was great it was my daughter's first day at her new school so she was super excited. I was up all night long, stressed completely out about it. Oh, but uh, yeah, so um, that's why I've got my my number one dad mug that she gave me for my birthday last year. With my daughter on the front, as well as my NASA mug. <laughs> so lots of mugs. Let's um, let's do this image transfer here. So once you've got your image printed out onto a, a regular pr piece of photocopy paper, inkjet, laser jet, you get it printed on your home printer, or you take it to work or whatever, then we're going to put it onto a nine by twelve sized canvas panel or canvas board. Now you can buy these exact well, you can buy this type of material at your local dollar store for a dollar or less. Um, they're, they, and that's going to be fine, especially if you're just getting started. I bought these, these Fix Smiths ones off of Amazon. You get like, uh, it's like 12 for 24 bucks, $2 a piece. And they're, they're more than twice as good of quality as the dollar store ones. I, I think they're, and you could certainly spend $5 at your local art supply store on one of them. I think that's a little bit too much for a canvas board personally. Um, so this is a, a really great uh, resource here. So they come wrapped in plastic. I take it out of the plastic. I give it a gentle sanding with a 220 grit sandpaper. You can see I've just wrapped it around a block of two by four. And then I put some white acrylic gesso over top, let that dry overnight and then sand it down again. And that gives me a really nice smooth surface. And personally, I love painting on smooth surfaces. It always makes life a lot easier. But, I mean, I'm sure there's people out there who fundamentally disagree with me about that and who say it's easier to paint on textured surface. That's the great thing about art, is that everyone has a different way of working, and I love that. I celebrate that. I want more of that. So, I'm just thinking, where do I want to... I guess I just want to put this roughly in the middle. My printer... Uh, gave it a little bit extra space down at the bottom. Okay, so I tape that down. And now I'm going to use some carbon transfer paper. Or actually, this is, I think, uh, graphite transfer paper. And I think this is definitely going to be probably the last time. I know I said that probably ten times recently. But you can see one side's black, or well, it used to be black, and one side's gray. They look very similar now, but the darker side is where the carbon or graphite's on, and that's what we're going to use to transfer onto the canvas. Those of you that remember using credit cards, and they put that into the device, and they make an impression across it, remember what carbon paper is. Some of the younger viewers here are probably completely mystified as to what that process was, unless they remember their parents doing this using carbon paper now I'm probably gonna do this very simply Um, because I'm probably going to paint over all of this. So, I'm just giving myself some landscape markers here. There's lots of different ways that we could do this, but, uh, um, because I'm probably going to paint that whole area just black 
completely. So all of these curves and things are definitely going to present major obstacles. Oddly enough, like, um, the easiest thing to paint is irregularly shaped organic uh, objects. Like apples, oranges, bananas. Because while they look similar, they're always kind of slightly different. And that gives us a lot of flexibility for if we make quote unquote mistakes. Well, you know, it's not like people are going to say, uh, it doesn't look like the, the banana that was on the shelf at the Safeway at 5.07 PM in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Um, it looks more like the, the apple that was on sale at the Whole Foods in, um, you know, um, Hartford, Connecticut on July 7th, 2017. Uh, and therefore you did it incorrectly. You painted the wrong uh, apple. Or did I say orange? Maybe, maybe I did. Um, so that gives us a lot of flexibility. The, the next, I think, most complicated thing would be painting... Um, well, then you... Then you have buildings, architecture. Um, so that can be a little bit more complicated because now you've got all of these straight lines and painting straight lines is pretty tricky. But um, you can get better and better at it by using rulers and tape, etc. Painting, and then, then painting faces is, is, gets, is also pretty difficult. But I would say probably painting circular shapes, curves and ovals, that can be one of the most difficult things that a person can paint because, um, you know, our wrist, I mean, it's, and sometimes it can be easier because we have the curve of our wrist, you know, the natural kind of curve, but it's different painting that as opposed to drawing it. So uh, this is going to be a bit of a challenge for us. I'm just going to, let's move. Speaking of the natural curve of your arm, or my arm. Probably good enough. Good enough for government work, as my grandfather always say. Wow, look at all those comments just blew up last time I looked. There are three comments, and now there's, I don't know, a couple dozen of them. That's great. Okay. So, you know, I said I was going to throw this out, but it did its job. You know, eventually, you could see how it gets a little bit patchy in places, and that's because there's just no carbon left to come to transfer off of the paper itself. But, you know, this is good. It shows that we can, I mean, I've probably used that one maybe 20 times or so. Uh, I'm actually very surprised. I thought I was going to pull it off and there's not going to be anything left there. But, um, hey, even I can be wrong. I know, I know it's mind-blowing but it is it, it happens on occasion uh -huh. <laughs> okay where is that let's put that in that direction 
Oh, now I got a big shadow. Okay. Well, let's. We don't need to prioritize the mug, do we? Okay, there we go. <laughs> Uh, wow, look at all of these comments. Um, Deborah says, in the movie Starman, Voyager 1 contacted a recording of the Rolling Stones. I can't get no satisfaction in the collection of the human race. Not sure if that was real, but fun. Oh, sorry, the Voyager 1 contained... Oh, I'm enlarged. Um, I don't know, it was, I can't get those, I don't know if the Rolling Stones, were they on that record? We're, we'll talk about it in a moment here. Um, Kathy says, Edie's growing up so fast, it's true, it's true. It's so sad. Randy says, hi everyone, I was watching a documentary on Norman Rockwell, interesting poster maker. Yeah, we did a, a painting, a Norman Rockwell version of Santa Claus for Christmas last year, I think we did, or the year before. So if you're interested in uh, looking more into Norman Rockwell, there's a whole episode devoted to him and a little bit about his biography as well. Okay. So, let's move on here. Bum, ba, da, ba, ba, boop. There we go. Our next step now is to apply a priming layer, or what's called the imprimatura. The priming layer, this is a strategy painters have used since before the Renaissance, so it really came into its own and it was popularized by Renaissance painters, painters like Leonardo da Vinci and Raphael, etc. Um, essentially what we're gonna do is coat the surface of the painting with a color. Now you can use whatever color you want, but um, I'm gonna use a warm yellow, which is not what Leonardo did, but it's a color that I like it's kind of become a little bit my signature through these episodes. And the reason I like using this warm yellow is it gives the painting a bit of a warm golden hour glow, Kodachrome kind of look that I really like. Now, traditionally artists would use like a warm brown, like a brick red kind of color, earthy tone, um, probably to mimic the look of wood panels which they had been painting on before they began painting onto canvas to probably mimic that that look and also give it um a basically what we would say like a mid-tone like between your lightest value and your darkest value so you're starting in the middle and then working back and forth this one's a little bit higher a much lighter but it's it's not white right so it's not your lightest value and it's certainly nowhere near the darkest so it's a little bit higher in there meaning that I'll be sort of darkening things and just a little bit of lightening on top. Now, in terms of the colors we're going to be painting here, um, I'm going to be using what's called a split primary palette. I didn't invent this technique, um, but I didn't know about it until maybe 10 years after I graduated from art school with my master's degree. And I started teaching, and when you start teaching, you start doing some research, and I stumbled upon this this approach and it was just like lightning bolts going off like whoa how come no one taught me this technique before this is amazing I've never heard of it um, and so I've been doing this now for the past 20 years or so so essentially using this technique we can mix virtually any color the human eye can see except some super saturated fluorescent colors um, that are extremely new and very infrequently used, right? So if you ever want to use those colors, you can just go buy them at your local art supply store. But essentially, we can mix all of our own colors, including black. So I, it says here eight tubes of paint, but we can get away with seven. I do have a black tube of paint, but I've only used it a couple times over the course of the past three years of painting. So we have two yellows, two reds, two blues, because we split each color into a 
warm and a cool or you could think of it as a foreground color and a background color right because every color is a temperature and temperature is one way we can create space in a painting so I'll, we'll talk about all this as we go. Now I'm gonna be using these Amsterdam paints, not sponsored, not paid by, not given a penny of free supplies or any anything except for your donations. That's why it's really, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful for the support of people like yourself who've been helping throughout the past three years of the program. And I'm gonna be using this Azo Yellow Deep. Now I've just scooped out extra paint in these tubes because let's say with this blue tube, I can't get any more paint out of it. But I had a whole bunch of those. I had 10 of them. And then I filled up a whole jar full of just what's left in here. So don't throw these out. You still got lots of paint left in these tubes. So these are the colors I suggest you use if you use Amsterdam. If you want to use Golden and you want to pay twice as much, this tube of paint costs about $30. This tube of paint costs about $14. So for roughly tw at least twice the price, you're getting a higher quality paint. But if you're just beginning, I wouldn't even think about it. I think it would be not only a waste of your money, but a bad idea. Because if you make a painting and you're not happy with it, or it starts to kind of go south, you might just start to, oh, man, I just wasted $20 of paint on this stupid painting. And you want to have a much more... Um, uh, happy experience and if you're just sort of painting you're like yeah it's not turn away I want but it's like you know a couple dollars worth of paint down the drain no problem right Liquitex Windsor and Newton these are all the paints I, I um, suggest you get if you if you're painting with these different brands um, and if you see other ones on here please let me know uh, there's I someone mentioned the other day abstract um, by is it Sennelier but I don't recommend Museum Color or Peebo because they put um, an, an, a higher amount of titanium white filler in their paints than all the other brands do now most brands maybe except Golden put a little bit of white paint into the paint to thicken it make it more opaque um, but these guys put too much in there and I, that drives me bonkers so Let's start out by putting some paint on the palette. Uh, the reason why it drives me bonkers is because, as I mentioned before, I like to mix my own black. And if you've got a paint that has a lot of um, white into it, you're not ever going to be able to make a black. You're only ever going to be able to make a gray. So that is just, it's, that drives me bonkers. Okay, I might as well just put some paint on the palette here quickly. Actually, well, let's let's I'll start this. Okay, so here we've got um, some of my Azo Yellow Deep Warm Yellow. Put a little bit of water into it. This is the only time I ever use water when I'm painting uh, with acrylics. People always ask, like, do I need to do this? Is it like, why do you do this? That's probably the most asked question I get. And that tells me that a lot of people have never seen this technique before. That a lot of people, because a lot of pe people who teach on YouTube uh, honestly don't have a lot of painting experience and they don't use this technique. They've never heard of it. It's a little, it, because it's certainly become much more obscure. A lot more um, modern painters, uh, pretty much since like the Impressionists kind of uh, stopped using it and it just sort of disappeared. Um, but if you go to art school, you would, and you took a painting course, if it was worth anything, they would at least mention this technique. I can't imagine. Um, um, not learning this in art school um, because it's um, I mean pretty much all of the 
the great painters that you've heard of going back into history used this process. Maybe not exactly the way I'm doing it, certainly not with the color that I'm using, because every artist does things a little bit differently. Artists are kind of contrarian by nature, and as soon as you tell an artist this is the way you do it, they're going to do the exact opposite. And honestly, that's a little bit of why the Impressionists kind of moved away from this technique. Not all of them. Some of them continued to do it. Some of them just experimented, like, hey, why not? Let's just, since we're questioning everything anyway, let's just see what, um, you know, what the difference would be. And there is a difference. The Impressionists liked it because it made the colors appear brighter and more more intense, more saturated. Um, and I like bright colors, but I I I, um, I want those colors to appear maybe a little bit more warm, rather than just purely bright. And often, really, actually, one of the things that the Impressionists did is they also added a lot of white into their paint. So they're, they're characteristically, Impressionist paintings are very uh, pastel. Um, so they, even though they used bright colors, they often kind of reduced the saturation anyway. So um, you sort of get back into what, what the Imprimatura does in the first place, right? So... Anyway, probably if you're watching, you're like, I have no idea. Can we just make this painting, Michael? None of this makes any sense. Okay, okay. I, I, fair, fair, fair. So, next step here. I, probably, I just want to blow dry that real quick here. Okay, sorry, just getting queued up here. Um, where should we begin? Okay, a little sip of tea here. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the history of the Voyager program and why I was so fascinated by this space probe or the two of them um, when I was a little kid. And I mean, I certainly wasn't the only one. This was one of the most exciting periods in space exploration history. So let's, um, let's go here to to Wikipedia. There's also an excellent page here that NASA maintains on their own website. And here you can see Voyager 1 in real time, um, what it looks like, where it is in, um, in space. And in fact, let's... Uh, Should I make that bigger? Uh, 
Okay, so this gives us an, an idea of the of our solar system. There we've got the sun right in the middle. Look at that big sun. Ooh, it's hot. Whoa, it's starting to kind of cool off a little bit. All right, you got Mercury. And then we keep on going. We got Venus. He even shows us where some of the, the more recent probes are, the Parker Solar Probe. Right, and then we've got oops, Earth. Let's let's go check out Earth here. There's Earth. Right, you can see there's Halley's Comet on its way. Wow. Um, um, there's Jupiter. As we go further away, there's Saturn, Uranus. Neptune, poor old Pluto, which was demoted. And then you can see way up here, there's Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. And I just want to show you this here, because I think it's helpful to see the, the plane that both of these are traveling at. You have Part of the trajectory of these probes is that Voyager 1, after it left the solar system, it went upwards from the, the plane of most of the rest of the planets, which are orbiting kind of in this kind of flat plane, and it went above so that it could take pictures above, right, and also see what's up in that direction. And then Voyager 2 went the opposite way. It went down. Although I'm sure some people would say, well, maybe Voyager 2 went up and Voyager 1 went down, or to the left or to the right, right? I mean, it's all relative, right? So um, anyway, I just think that's fascinating. This tool is available for you to, to, to look at on uh, the, um, the, the NASA website here. You can see that it has been operating now for 46 years, zero months, zero days, 10 hours, 38 minutes, and 34 seconds since it was first launched by NASA on September 5th, 1977. So the, the primary mission of the Voyager probes was to take um, measurements, scientific measurements, um, and photographs, documentation of the various different planets in the outer parts of the solar system. So the inner parts being, you know, Mercury and Venus and the Sun, and the outer ones would be everything beyond Earth, you know, and, and you know, generally considered beyond Mars, which is, um, you know, uh, kind of, I guess, maybe probably it's still in the inner solar system. Uh, so... It, and it certainly achieved those, um, well, and I should actually say, so there were two Voyager crafts, right? So Voyager 1, which is launched on um, 16 days after Voyager 2, which is launched in, in late uh, August of 77. And um, their, they had a, their mission was essentially maybe to go past Pluto, and then we'll see, right? So they had maybe a 10, 15 year targeted lifespan, like fingers crossed that something might happen as, as most of like, you hear about like the space rovers, right? They're supposed to be there for a year or two. And then here, like 10 years later, they're still sending signals back. Um, uh, once they achieve their primary missions, and if things keep on going, well, let's just keep going until they stop communicating. And we are getting very close. Probably if you're watching this video in a few years, uh, we will no longer be in contact with um, either of these probes that they're, the, the, the batteries that are running on plutonium will have expired. Um, I mean, the fact that they're still able to communicate and they're outputting about as much power as the light bulb in your refrigerator and they're sending signals back from billions and billions of kilometers away is spectacular. In fact, again, let's... Um, which page was it? Was it on this one? Oops. 
huh, there was a really cool timer. Where did I, what did I do with that? Darn it. Uh, oh, maybe this is it right here. Sorry. Um, this gives us an idea of the distance. Whoa. So Voyager 1 distance from the Earth is 24 billion 84 million 500 kilometers, right? So you could see, look how fast that's going. It's going up about a thousand kilometers every two seconds or so, right? And you could see obviously even much further away from the sun but this is from the earth and if you want the the uh, the imperial miles here let's just zoom in on that you just see these numbers tick up tick up tick up so the the voyager probe voyager one is the farthest human made object from the sun and it has now escaped the the solar wind so it has officially escaped uh, the the um, uh, Earth or the Sun's gravitational pull, and it has left our solar system and is considered to be an interstellar space, which is absolutely just blows my mind. Right? It kind of feels, you know. I, and again, if you're, of, of, I was born just a, a ten days after the launch of, of Voyager One, so part of my life in some way I can kind of measure it according to where Voyager is in our solar system we can see just a few little updates here also Voyager 2 which is not quite as far away so it's interesting Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 even though Voyager 1 was launched um, I think is this the map there's an interactive map I think somewhere here on Just showing kind of how it used various different planets for its um, uh, to give it some kind of assists to 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 hit different targets. Uh, so I want to, there was one that shows. Well, let's just it's it's just interesting that that even though Voyager 2 was launched before Voyager 1, it has taken a slower trajectory, so it's not it's not as far, it's still very far away from, uh, from the Earth, but Voyager 1 was launched on a different trajectory that has made it go much faster. So here we just have some images that are very famous images that Voyager 1 took, the, the first really close-up view of the giant red spot or the great red spot there on Jupiter. Um, one of the things that this just this blew my mind when I was a little kid was the uh, the images of Jupiter's moon Io, which um, was shown to have these giant sulfuric volcanoes. And I remember as a little kid doing a science project. Remember science fairs as a kid where I used dry ice inside of a little volcano and it was pluming with, and so, uh, you know, ever since the beginning, I've been fascinated with outer space. Uh, here you can see an eruption of one of these volcanoes, the volcano Loki on Io. Oh, wow. And there's Europa, another of the moon. Um, the very famous image of Saturn. In fact, I I should show you. Maybe I'll well, I'll show you after the different images that I was considering using for this. But here's um, uh, the Saturn on its closest approach, uh, or sorry, four days after its closest approach. Um, and some of the tiny little um, uh, moons and asteroids. They did it. There was a choice between 
Voyager 1 going getting close to Pluto or passing close to Saturn's moon Titan. And the choice was made to go by Titan because Titan, we knew a little bit more of it at the time and we knew that it had some kind of atmosphere. So the choice was to go close to Titan and sort of forego Pluto. Poor Pluto, just always getting neglected, right? Um, this is a very, this is also a very famous photograph or composite photograph. It's called the Family Portrait. And here we have, um, uh, as, as, um, what am I called? As uh, Voyager 1 is starting to kind of make its upward trajectory away from the, the plane of the planets. It's able to kind of start to see them from a little bit of a higher angle and see them kind of all together. And so here we can see all these different planets orbiting the sun and where they are in relationship to one another from the perspective of Voyager. I think that's fascinating. It's such a bizarre kind of image, but the fact that it contains all of these different... Um, uh, all the various different planets in there I think is fascinating. All right, so here's kind of a mock-up. Right, you can see uh, Voyager kind of above looking down on those various different planets. Oh, here's another great example showing you its elevation as it sped uh, out. Um, this is also another super famous image that was really popularized by the the author scientist Carl Sagan. Um, this the idea of the pale blue dot that here as Voyager was um, getting close to exiting our solar system it turned around and took a picture of our solar system and that little dot it's worth just taking a quick little oops this little dot here that's us we're <laughs> hard to find. There we go. Ah! So in the incredible vastness of space, that is Earth. That's where we are right now. And that I just find absolutely fascinating. And one, of, and that's what Carl Sagan said. It's like all the way he kind of uh, presented it is, you know, think about all of the, the history of the Earth, the dinosaurs, all the epic wars and great novels and music and you know the the, the love affairs, the murders, the, all of the stories it all exists and has happened right on that little speck the size of a tiny little grain of sand from the perspective of Voyager and so he was sort of imploring us to kind of put that into perspective um, that how kind of silly it is or and trivial our our um, our disputes are with one another, and when we think of like the grand scale of the universe, Kathy says sure makes you feel small, doesn't it? Absolutely. Um, what else? Okay, so this just as a, as a quick little um, demonstration of. The, the flight paths and also the extent of our solar system and beyond which the sun has has no um, uh, influence. And so there's this kind of area and there was sort of thought to be like, would, would things be able to escape past that, this, this, you know, we didn't know what was there. Would some, would it just be like running up against a glass bubble or would it bounce back and come back to earth or would it get you know dis would it disintegrate um, like what is beyond the, the 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 reach of the sun would um would it get immediately sucked into the orbit of something else and so there was a lot of attention paid to what exactly was happening and and there wasn't a big like it was just everything kind of became very quiet so it's interesting if you look at the um, the the readings of Voyager um, as it as it left that space uh, as it left our space I guess and went into interstellar space um, 
how how things have you know what what it was recording because really as i said voyager wasn't supposed to last this long i mean it was hoped that it would but you know we're talking about a computer that is um, about as powerful as a calculator you know one of those old calculators you might remember from school right that's what the power of the voyager one computer there's more power in your there's like hundreds more um power and computing power in our smartphones than there is in the giant computer that was um, um, built into Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. And so the fact that it's still working at all, I mean, how many of us are still using our very, very, very first computers, right? I remember we had an Amiga back in the 80s, right? That's in the garage, I think, my parents' garage. Um, uh, it hasn't been used in 30 plus years, but here's Voyager 1 still trucking along. Um, so, what else do I want to mention? Well, let's, uh, one of the most interesting things, and it got brought up there in the chat, was the famous Golden Record. So the Golden Record was um, a two-sided gold record that was mounted onto the outside of the Voyager spacecraft. So you could see here is on the outside. I think there's a probably a... Uh... So here's some of the images that are that are encoded on there. I want to see there's... Uh, so you could see here's what that record... It was, there's actually a kind of a little container for it. Um, and... You could see, you know, they, they took it pretty seriously. There was two identical records, one for each of the Voyager spacecraft. You could see them etching it, plating it with gold. The gold is, is intended there to help preserve it because gold is, is a very, um, you know, a, a fairly stable substance that is can resist really, really high temperatures and really cold temperatures as well. Okay, there you go. See, so you can see them mounting this onto the outside of the spaceship there. Obviously, they made a f more than one copy of it. Um, there is an excellent website here that uh, NASA has where they have lots of images and they have uh, audio recordings, all sorts of things on here. So you can really explore it in um, in in great depth you can see here you can listen to the entire 90 minutes of the side a which has all the sounds of the earth including some music and then the other side has the images um, on there so they've got I mean <laughs> what I think about is is if let's say this landed in my backyard and I pulled this record off and I started to look at it would I be able to figure out what we're looking at here um i don't know you know it's an interesting choice all of these different images like i don't i mean if a, if a record fell into my backyard would i knowing nothing about records be able to figure out how to play that record even me knowing how a record works would i be able to figure i mean i remember taking i think maybe i mean this a long time ago taking like a like a little safety pin or something or just like a just a pin taping it inside of a cone like this and then taking a record and spinning it and you could hear music coming out of the side um i remember doing that as like a project maybe in elementary school maybe it was when we were talking about the voyager spacecraft and the golden record um but if you didn't know that that side contained music, I, pff, good luck. Uh, let's just see if here there's a list of, um, so you can see first they have a whole bunch of different greetings in various different languages, right? So that you could play it back and you could hear people from various different um, backgrounds speaking. Um, let's scroll down because we have there is music on there. 
question is, was it the Rolling Stones? Here, uh, I'm, I don't know, it could be, we'll see. You can see here's also some sounds of things like Morse code and trains, airplanes flying, heartbeats, winds, various different animals making sounds, volcanoes and thunder, you, uh, heartbeat brain waves. And then we have a lot of music on here. So you have Bach. And it's not just Western music. It's so, so that I think is, you know, for the 70s, you know, people tend to kind of think like, you know, it's only today where people woke up and uh, started taking a non Eurocentric view of the world. But, you know, to its credit, NASA included music from Indonesia, Africa, um, South America, uh, Latin America. Uh, so we have Chuck Berry. So I'm just trying to think of things that might be recognizable to viewers. So Johnny B. Good, Chuck Berry. Was that, does Johnny B. Good, is that the one that Michael J. Fox plays in Back to the Future 1? Is that Johnny B. Good? Let's just see. Okay, yeah. So so Johnny B. Good was the, the that famous song that Michael J. Fox plays in Back to the Future. I just wanted to double check that. Um I mean look, they've got almost a song by by from major countries got even from Russia, which was our quote unquote adversary during the Cold War. And so they there's a Stravinsky song. There was Bach and Beethoven. Got some old blues. Uh, so no, it doesn't appear that the Rolling Stones were on here. Let me just see, let's just... No, no Rolling Stones on the golden record there, oops. Um, I did, what, what is the last little stuff? Okay, and here's all the images, maps, and things. Um, again... All of these links are in the description below, and if they're not there, I'll put them after the show. But if you want to go in and you want to listen to the actual record itself, uh, all of that... Um, oh, I guess it's not it used to be on here. There are certainly YouTube videos that play the entire record out there. Um... One, another thing I should mention is I'm just since I'm just really quickly scrolling around here on the the NASA website, NASA, again to its credit, um, has you can download every single picture that has ever been taken by any of the NASA spacecraft going all the way back to the very beginning. Um, you can download them and use them. Um, they've they're they're given to the people of Earth. Um, and I think that's that's really cool that uh, all of that, all of the data, all of the images are all provided um, to us uh, for free. I mean, we, we I mean, well, Americans paid for it, but there is and there's no Canadian instruments as far as I know on Voyager one. But uh, anyway, I think I should probably move on and start painting here. I just find this stuff so fascinating and we'll probably cover a little talk about this a little bit more as we go. So now what I want to do is potentially a little bit of underpainting. And different artists have different ideas of what constitutes underpainting. As different artists have different ideas of what the imprimatura should be. Um, so that uh, essentially that one of the views for an underpainting would be to actually combine underpainting and imprimatur into one process and use um, like a, uh, a brown 
And rather than coating the whole surface as we've done here, to instead um, paint just, you know, very quickly, kind of draw out your composition with that imprimatura stain, uh, either just doing that and leaving the rest white, or going in and painting, you know, some of it with a darker, thicker version of that paint. That's usually if you're painting a landscape or a portrait and you're not sketching it out, you're just literally painting it out for the first time. Um, and again, that's a very impressionist approach, right? It, you're, it's a very spontaneous, takes a lot of courage and command control to be able to pull something like that off. Um, so let's mix, let's, let's mix a, um, a black we're gonna need a lot of black dark painting <laughs> big dark painting now you don't have to make a, your own black you could just use black right out of the tube But um, a, a number of reasons why we might not want to do that is that um, using uh, black, black is, is such a dominant color that it's going to want to leap forward. And um, the problem with that is we kind of want that the black here in space to appear kind of a little bit behind things, All right? Because if we have black in the background, it's going to appear to be in front of everything. So Pascal says. It's mission to boldly go where no one has gone before. That's true. Or the original Star Trek was where no man has gone before, and then they changed it for next generation to where no one has gone before. Goes to show that even a utopian program like Star Trek can still, there's still room to grow, right? And to be more inclusive. Oh, I forgot my white. Just trying to think, what if, I've never done this before, and I'm going to do it before I change my mind, what if I paint my underpainting with white instead of black? <laughs> because I'm going to paint all of this black, and if it's all black, and I paint black lines, obviously the, the, the only thing I'll be able to rely on is the texture coming through to help me see where those lines are. So if I instead use white, perhaps I might be able to get a... a line here. So I'm going to try painting a line with my paintbrush using a ruler here. Um, I don't know if, I'll, if I can show. 
show this. It's not going to come across very well, I don't think. Um, what I'm doing is I'm just lifting the ruler up a little bit to help give me a little bit more room between my paintbrush. See if I can do it the other way. It's a little bit, a little bit awkward, <laughs> but uh, so I'm not sure. So you can see that there's room underneath there, right? And so then I can take my. This is also, by the way, a great way to practice doing a different technique is on a canvas, like at this stage of the painting process, where, you know, I'm going to, I plan on painting all of this out anyway. So if it gets, if I don't like these lines, well, it's not like I've committed all that much to it because, um... I don't even have to paint, worry about painting it away because it's just going to get covered up. What I'm doing here, just really quickly, is I'm just adding maybe just a little bit of extra texture at the top and bottom. So if I this does get completely obliterated, I'll see a little bit of these markers and be able to use my, my ruler to line it back up and try doing another straight line there. So similarly, I'm just going to try painting a little bit. You see how it's kind of a little bit thicker? Now, acrylic paint is, is water-based, so as it dries, the water evaporates and the paint loses its texture, mostly. And generally, that's a good thing. Like, well, depending on who you talk to. I'm deliberately trying to build up a little bit of texture so that later on I'll be able to I'm also hoping that the um, white will resist a bit of the black and show through a little bit now my plan is to paint white back over top of all of this. Now, I could use white carbon paper, which I do have. Okay. 
So there's that. Let's look at some of these rings now. Or maybe, why don't we try doing both um, methods with this painting? Why not, right? So we'll do one with texture and then one with white carbon paper. That way, instead of being like, well, we could have done it this way, and who knows how it would have turned out. Let's do both of them. And then we, we can, or you can just use my painting as an idea, give you an idea of what works or maybe what doesn't work for your own artwork. Um, lining up those rings again is going to be basically impossible although there maybe I can think of a few ways we could get closer to it um, but yeah we'll, we'll talk about that here momentarily let's so I'm gonna blow dry this Okay, so one of the reasons, I, there's a few things I was doing here. One, I, I was blow drying with this up here because one thing I find is if I do a lot of blow drying on my mat, the mat starts to kind of uh, heave and kind of get, and then it, it slowly goes back down to, to its normal. But I don't, I just first of all, I don't think that's probably good for the mat. And I want to keep this mat as long as possible. Um, so, and also just to kind of help the drying process there so that if, um, uh, now, again, I really want to make sure this is nice and dry because if it's not dry and I start painting black over it, it's going to like pop little zits of white paint in here and then that white paint's going to smear and mix into the black and then you'll hear all sorts of screams. One thing I just, as I was doing this, I'm thinking to myself, what if... I do the opposite. One was I tried using texture to create things that I might see, like so by by creating uh, is it concave texture, so that the things are going to come off, or I'm going to emboss the surface. And then I thought, why not do the opposite here, which would be to to point, put little spots or, or uh, in here that might be able to help me see. So let's do that. So I'm going to take a little pin here. Just look, you know, your typical little uh, pin that you might put on your, your your shirt here. And let's say, what happens if I make little pin pricks? Around the edge of the planet. Now it's possible that these this will just get covered with paint and I won't be able to see any of it. Oops. I mean I can hardly <laughs> I can't really see what lines I've already done as it is. I think I started down here, didn't I? But 
I'm always trying to think of just different techniques. You can kind of see it maybe a little bit more clearly here where there's the line is much thinner. Because, you know, using the underpainting works really well if you're going to paint a lighter color over a background. So this could be a waste of time, but wouldn't it be awesome if it wasn't? Okay. Barbara says, hi everyone, I just woke up. There's an owl hooting right outside my window. <laughs> uh, Pascaline says, I'm so tired, I'll have to watch tomorrow. Have a good time, everyone. Deborah says, it's taken almost five decades to get to Saturn. Wow. Yes, Kathy, I feel small. Oh, sorry, um, it actually, it passed Saturn in November of 1980. So, you know, it actually only took about three years to get to Saturn. Um, it's the last four decades which have um, been its journey from there. So that gives you an idea of how big our solar system is. How, you know, the, the, the scale of... Of, is just it's kind of hard to believe that okay so it took three years so it's 40 it's been 43 years almost you know let's say 42 years and nine months since um uh saturn or since voyager one passed saturn so and it just over the past few years escaped Earth's solar winds, right? So, I mean, I yeah, I, I, I can't even this that that level of scale is just mind boggling. I'm sure my parents still have in their basement a, a dog eared copy of the probably December issue of the National Geographic from 1980. In fact, let's, I just, now I have to check this out. Let's, uh, what was it? So, National Geographic. Um, That's the cover. Oh, I think this must be it. Rings of Saturn. What issue is this? July 1981. So this might have been from Voyager 2, which passed by Saturn shortly after. Interesting. Okay, sorry. Stay, stay focused, Michael. Okay, so let's uh, let's mix our paint up here. So you can see what I've done is I put my cool blue, my cool yellow, and my warm red together here on the palette. And I'm going to mix these up and create a giant mixture of black. Yeah, it's a little bit on the red side. I was trying not to scoop all of that red in there. It was, it's not bad. 
but it will be a little bit warmer. Well, now actually, as I mix more of it in, it seems to be going back to black. It's still, still a little bit more on the warmer side. Now this is a pretty thick mixture, so if I paint that, the likelihood that I'm going to get those little dots very low, it's probably going to cover that out. That's going to get obliterated. But... Okay. So this could all be for naught here. So another thing I do when I start painting like this is I try to go in different directions. This was taught to me by one of my uh, mentors, a guy I, I, I worked with or worked for in, when I was in graduate school in Los Angeles, a painter named James Hayward, Jimmy Hayward, a cowboy painter. He's a cowboy. He doesn't paint cowboys. Um... And uh, he taught me to, to paint in these sort of like cross-hatching kind of patterns. Because what that does, it helps the paint get into the weave of the canvas. So once we're assured of that, then I'm just going to go... I'm not sure, can you see those... So what I'm going to do is I'm going to blow dry that. In fact, even before I do that, let's... I want to get rid of any kind of... ridge. Maybe this wasn't the smartest idea. I don't see my little... Pin pricks, I don't think so anyway. Okay, let's blow dry that, and then we'll see. I, I may want to do another coat 
on that background just to make it darker, but let's just see. Okay, great. This is amazing to see some of this. Um, now, I should have just left it, and I couldn't resist touching it, but I want to show you some stuff. I'm going to zoom right in, because this is kind of exciting to see. Um, you can see here, those are the... I don't see, is that in focus? Let's try. You can see my little dotted line, so I actually um, should have just left it. Let's see, you can see... Uh, you can see it a little bit better here on the bottom. Let's see, a little dotted line. I'm not sure you, if you can see it here in the black. But I can see it. So that is, that's, I'm actually very, it's, I'm, it doesn't surprise me too much because it is right there on that edge. But I'm, I'm angry with myself that I tried to blur that away with my paintbrush, meaning it's, Like right up here. Ah, darn it. Okay, so I'm gonna do what I just did. I'm gonna do a second coat of it. But that would give you a good a good idea that if you wanted to do this step, you have a reasonable chance of being able to get away with um that black sufficiently covering up. Oh, and also the satellite showed through really well. I didn't even show that, but... So this is just going to help give me like a, a really, really dark, deep black. Now remember, this is not black out of the tube. This is black that I mixed myself. If it was black out of the tube, it would be much more likely to be very opaque. And probably one coat would be more than enough.
But this should also make uh, make sure that there's no little gaps here where there might be a little bit of that yellow coming through. Not that that would be a problem. And if it was, we could just put a little star there to blur it out. Okay, so what I'm going to end up doing, I think, is I'm going to paint this white. And then... Do the transfer over top of it again. I'm just trying to think how I want to proceed here. going to take my black and consolidate it here so that as this paint dries oops, looks, uh, I don't know if that's going to work now There's a, there are some little hidden pockets of paint that I didn't really mix in well so I could try to get away with reusing this black for touch-ups but because I see some of that red and, and blue kind of reappearing, what it means is probably likely that this black might be slightly different than the original. Now again, if you're using black right out of the tube, not so big of a difference. Okay, so let's uh, let's blow dry this again.
Okay, so this probably won't show up on camera, but I'll just show you what I see on my dotted line. I can still see all my little dots, but I also created a little ridge here when I use my paintbrush. So my painting kind of, I see this little ridge here. So that means I need to kind of expand this. Okay. Well, let's follow the dotted line. I think probably actually using the hair dryer really helped for this because the hair dryer might have helped push paint down or away. from those little dots. So let's, uh, I'm gonna have to, ex I'm just gonna expand this to cover up my little folly. That right here is the most egregious, which is why it looks probably a little bit uneven right there. It's because that's where the worst of it happened. Still looks a little bit pointy here, doesn't it? Where 
Where did my scissors go? <laughs> so, I always get feedback from people saying, I, I love seeing you make mistakes. <laughs> uh, here we go. I like seeing when I make a mistake because you can see how I fix my problems. So roughly that's where that originally went. So it's just a matter of expanding beyond there. You can see where that's a little bit wider, a little bit thinner. Wow, I can really see all my little dots now. Let's, I want to show you that. Can you see all those little dots? It really came through. I'm actually, I'm totally shocked, to be honest, that they're as visible as they are. I mean, that's just... dry that. I'm just, yeah, let's blow dry that. Um, so the reason why I've gone to this elaborate, ah, just clean my brush, put it right into a blob of black paint. Um, the reason why I've gone to this elaborate uh, roundabout way of, of doing this, rather than just painting and leaving a little sharp edge there, is I didn't want it to look like the brush strokes just boom, ended here. Like there were all this little fussiness right around. So I deliberately painted right over top of the planet so that it looks like that the planet is in front of the background right another option i could have just painted let's say a black in prematura and just used white carbon paper over top the one thing is we may see here when i do the rings with that white carbon paper is my fear is some of it's going to stick to this black background but we're going to find out very shortly what works and what doesn't. And, you know, something that the other 
thing that can be kind of frustrating is what might work for me might not work as well for you just based on the paints you're using, you know, where on earth you're painting and the, the humidity, temperature. I mean, it's all chemicals, right? And some, some chemicals are going to behave different in different situations. So I'm just putting my Imprimatura back over top of this white so that I don't have because if I if I just start painting colors over top of it the colors are going to behave differently over the white than they are over the yellow I want the colors to behave the same because one thing that might it could look really strange if we had one color you know the color kind of we it would just really point out the that there was some kind of mistake or something was corrected and I tried to fix it so I'm doing my best to kind of cover my tracks here, I guess you could say. So there, one, there will be a slight texture change here because this ha is going to be, you know, I painted that white so it's kind of smoothed over and maybe even added a bit of texture, whereas here we have back down close to the gesso. So it's likely and, and maybe possible there's going to be a little bit of difference. There is now just a, in some places a little bit of white fringing around the edge. In, depending on what I'm painting, that could be a problem. But here, that might actually just look like a little bit of glow from the sun, you know, or a you know, reflection from a moon or something. As there is in the original, there's just this little bit of fuzziness. So, I don't, I don't mind that actually. And I, I could even play with that a little bit as we go forward. In fact... Yeah. So that actually, that was my Imprimatura, well, Imprimatura underpainting and even background combined all into one process here. So a lot of work to get to this place, but I'm also really happy because I've got a really nice, solid black background that now appears to be underneath this uh, planet, this um, semicircle. And, you know, everybody's paint, everybody's goals for paintings are a little bit different. I mean, some people would look at that and be like, are you kidding me? All that work to for such a subtle effect, right? Like you spent you know, 45 minutes to get to here. I could have painted that and be done in, in five minutes. And that's, I totally get it. I totally get that. Um, and, you know, with all these classes, I sometimes, I ask myself, like, what is, do I want to teach people how to do this painting as quickly as humanly possible? Um, and I, cause I get emails from like high school teachers saying they want to use these classes. And I'm like, yeah, go right ahead. Use all, all the materials. And so for, in that instance, you know, they're just trying to get something done in a short amount of period of time. that looks pretty good. Get it. And I think, but then do I want to show people like, you know, how we could do it better? Like do like a almost museum quality version and so it's, and I'm like, well, probably anybody watching this is not interested in, in that level 
of quality. So I try to kind of go a little bit in between, showing people if you were trying to get it done as quickly as possible, this is what I would do, or I could maybe explain it. But, and if you want to do a little bit more advanced, kind of this is what we would do, right? So, did I, did I just blow dry that or not? I don't know what. I'm not sure I, if I know what I'm doing these days. I think I'm, I don't know if I blow dried this. Let's do that. Okay, so I'm just going to bring these lines back in here. One thing with these lines is they kind of curve quite dramatically just right before they... Here's those rings. Okay. So I think that's, it's not going to match up perfectly. I think that's close. So. use some black carbon paper because probably very few people have white carbon paper and uh, where is my white carbon paper uh, I do have that oh. I used to keep it in here right I used it so in Sparingly and frequently. say maybe we're gonna be using black anyway okay so here's my white carbon paper and very careful about this because I don't want those lines 
Like, let's just see. Ah, so it's all different than I expected. Okay. So you can see I'm just testing it on a black surface. Okay, so it was... I, I'm totally mistaken. I thought it would have been on... Okay, I guess that makes sense. The shiny side facing down. Okay. I just don't want this carbon to stick to the black, so... But like, let's say right now, this painting turns into a complete disaster. All right, my fingers crossed that it won't. But right now I've, I've taught myself, ooh, that's, yeah, there's a little, okay. So let's move this out of the way. I'll show you a bit of what happened that I didn't want to happen happened in that you could see some of that carbon stuck to the surface of the canvas. So let's see if I can wipe some of that away. It rubbed off actually surprisingly well. I think I'm just gonna try to gently Clean this off. Just wipe any excess away. Almost like I'm trying to get rid of it. See, my, my fear is that, I, that there would be like a little bit of a white halo here. So maybe just what I'm going to do is just take this rag and just go over all of that black. So that it's all consistent. If there's going to be a white smudge, well now I've smudged it over the whole black surface a little bit. Now, obviously, I could have done the the um, satellite, not satellite, the probe, Voyager One. I could have traced that as well, and maybe I, maybe I'll still end up doing that. We'll see. But I thought let's get the the rings in because the satellite is going to be in front of this, and obviously also lining this back up to the texture, impossible. So. Let's let's cross that bridge if we do need to do so when we get there. So, as I said, I've, I've, I personally have learned a lot in this episode already using trying to, like trying to come up with creative solutions to problems that I might have I'm not well, I guess kind of created for myself, but would have inevitably came up with that that I can only kind of conceptualize a solution, but I don't know if it'll actually work. So here, like the little dotted lines, 
or little dots that I put to help me see the outside of the of Saturn. That worked way better than I ever thought it would. And so that probably would have been a, a really good solution for the rings and even for the the um, space probe Voyager 1 rather than trying to paint with texture. Um, but I wouldn't have known, I mean, I, and again, I could have painted this whole thing black and then just painted or done my tracing over top of it. That could have also worked. But it is what it is now. And so if I was to restart this, that might have been the, the best, fastest solution is to use white carbon paper on a black background. So I'm gonna paint the space probe last. So the so really what I wanna do now is let's paint Saturn. And I wanna paint the, the planet and then the rings afterwards. So let's go to this here. Okay. So now we overcame a few different uh, problems that arose when I painted my background layer and obliterated the rings and part of the of Saturn, the planet itself. Now we got the rings back. We have the, still the texture of the Voyager space probe kind of hidden in the black, but we'll see if we can resurrect that. I really want to focus on painting the planet and then the rings itself here. So let's look at planet. And just think about the colors we want to use here. So this is, uh, you know, in the background, right? So we want to use cooler colors if we can to help push that planet further away so that the space probe itself will seem in front. And we're going to try to use warmer colors for that. So here we've got a very cool icy blue, which is also a little bit atypical when I think of Saturn. When I think of Saturn, I tend to think of, um, oh, I love that image too, that green. I was gonna say, Let's look up Saturn Voyager. Let's give it more specific Voyager 1. <laughs> you know, my my conception of Jupiter is primarily a yellow and brown planet. All right, so this is actually a very famous image. In fact, maybe it's worth me just showing you some of the other ideas I was thinking about doing, other composites I created. So I spent a lot of time even using different images of the space probe before I landed on that one. I kind of liked this one facing Saturn as opposed to facing away from it seemed to make sense, even though we don't see the actual inside of the, the satellite dish. What do you think? Do you like those colors or should I try using a slightly different set of colors? So some so these images, I, I think one thing people may, may not be aware is that the cameras aboard these spaceships are using also are, are capturing more than just the, the visible spectrum that our eyes can see. They are using like infrared. And, uh, various different, like, because we only see a very small part of the visible spectrum. So, and then they, they put it through a computer, and then they kind of extract, and then there's often, there's actually artists who kind of manipulate those images. So often what we see of outer space is different than maybe necessarily exactly what we would expect to see if we were in a spaceship looking out the window. So that does give us a lot of freedom I am tempted to paint this painting a little bit different than the original 
and go for a bit more of this yellowy look. The look that comes to mind when I think Now, Lisa says, I like the colors. Green or blue is nice. Okay. Uh, S. Dor says, Hi, I watched your drawing course and I really enjoy it. I'm currently on lesson number 10. I want to ask you if you will ever continue the course or make more videos related to drawing and thanks for doing it uh, great question uh, the answer is yes probably it's gonna be about six or seven months before that but I, I do my one of my long-term plans is, is redoing the entire drawing course and updating it and giving it a little bit of a cleaner look but probably I might do what I do with the master study series, but do that with drawing. Like the, instead of just paintings, like I've been doing for the past couple of years, do drawings instead. Because I often get tons of questions like, show me how to draw Dragon Ball Z or S Super Mario Brothers or Zelda or such and such. So um, that's something that I'm, I'm strongly considering. Great question. Thank you. I'm glad you're enjoying the drawing program. So, <sighs> hmm. Well, one thing I do like. I, have to, I see that there's almost like a bit of a bluish glow around the edges. So maybe it makes sense to apply a thin, cool blue over top of all of this. And then... Okay, so let's let's do that. I know there's I'm diddle daddling around trying to conceptualize this here, but uh, so I'm gonna put just a little. Well, let's put a bit more. <laughs> Astro sounds sounds great. I hope to finish all 40 videos of the original drawing course before you start the new ones. That sounds great. I would love for that to happen. Yeah, and obviously like, subscribe, so that when those new videos do pop up, you'll be ready to go and you, you, you won't uh, have to search for it. Okay, so... What I'm going to do now is I'm going to take some matte medium. Matte medium is just clear acrylic paint without any pigment in it. So all of these paints are made with a medium and powdered pigment. So this is just the raw substance. You can use a gloss medium. I have gloss medium. But um, so let's take this matte medium. I do prefer matte over gloss. Now, if I paint this blue just like this, I might get a little bit more of a of a green appearing because it's going to mix optically, this blue over top of the yellow. So instead, I'm going to take a little bit of white, mix that in here, and that's this is one of the reasons why I'm adding so much matte medium is that it's going to help um, prevent that white from just obliterating that yellow. That's pretty close. I'm expecting a bit of that yellow to come through. I mean, I didn't put much white in there at all.
see some of my pencil lines are a little bit sensitive to this and want to kind of disappear. So that's another reason why that matte medium helps prevent that paint from getting too opaque. In fact, I just had a little bit of a... Ugh. Let's paint. Okay, so you have, sometimes that's the thing with the matte medium is because it dries ah, much quicker. Or not quicker, it just dries fairly quick. Um, sometimes you end up pulling paint off rather than putting paint on. So let's blow dry this. Okay, and I just had a little bit of a brain wave of maybe taking a bit of glazing fluid now and just giving a little bit of like a, a soft edge around here. Maybe let's start at a little bit more hidden place up top here. Okay. So I'm going to take my 
fluid. This is my glazing fluid. It's got a slow dry medium in it. Looks like it needs to be a bit thicker. So this is something, now that I'm doing it, I'm like, man, I should have done this much earlier. Maybe when I was applying, instead of using um, matte medium, I could have used glazing medium for the background, or for the, to cover the planet, but... I think I'll live in the, I think the paint police have, are, are always investigating more egregious examples things then uh, always seem to turn a blind eye to me maybe to you as well hmm something happened there that I don't like what is that let's just wipe that away It's actually pretty cool. Like it's, I think it's more visible on camera than it is in person. So let's blow dry that. gonna do that again I really like this effect ooh yeah just softening out that edge is also gonna make a huge difference in making it look a little bit further behind slightly out of focus now it's it's I'm it's not gonna turn out exceptionally well because 
I've got that fairly hard edge that I kind of inadvertently created. But that's kind of cool. Actually, I, I'm I'm really digging that. It's very subtle. And I think it looks much better in person than it does on camera there, but because the camera the brightness is boosted. So you end up seeing a little bit more of my mistakes than maybe I would care to have you see, but we're all here to learn, right? So So I think, I mean, again, it doesn't look exceptional in person or on camera, but in person, I think that's going to look really nice. I mean, I could, let's just, uh, I'm actually just going to blow dry one more time. Just gonna do that just a little bit more right on the edge. This also gives it the illusion of a bit of atmosphere, too. Right? That it's not just a, a hard pebble floating around there, that there's, you know, a climate and uh, a whole cities full of space aliens and who are uh, keeping an eye on the Holy Grail and the information about JFK's assassination, it's all being carefully orchestrated by our, our sat, uh, what, the sat, Saturnites? Saturians? Saturanians? <laughs> okay, I like that. I like this. It looks great.
Sorry, I was just saying, I'm now I'm taking some cool red, a little bit of white and glazing fluid because I like the fact that the glazing fluid allows me to do a little bit of buffing of those colors. Um, so, Let's not only just buff the, the, the front off, let's... Now that yellow that I put down there, that's or the blue that I put over, and see it's a little bit patchy. Originally, I was like, oh, "Man, I'm gonna paint that and fix it," but now I think it could actually do some really interesting things and make it look like there's maybe that's the surface there, or shifting winds and different things going on underneath the surface. So that would be what Bob Ross talks about when he's talking about the happy accident right it's like ah here's this thing that i wanted a bit more of a unified surface and i didn't get that but it could turn out to be a really fortuitous quote unquote mistake So I could see myself now spending hours doing this, creating all sorts of of stripes and things. I want to try to wrap this part out in within the next 45 minutes at most here. Let's um, let's just keep on going. Let's just I'm gonna mix some color into that. Let's start with a little bit of cool yellow. You know I should blow dry this. I always tell myself blow dry it, and then I never do, and then I end up wiping paint away. I get impatient, so let's do the right. Great question, Barbara says, would masking fluid have helped to keep the outline here? Would you ever use it? Um, that's a good, you know, 
have, I don't know if I've used Masking Fluid in one of these episodes. Maybe for next week's episode I should. I have a big jar of it that I've been meaning to use on one of these episodes. And maybe next week's would be a good time to use it. It's going to be kind of um, a bit of a different... We're going to be sort of painting a sculpture. Or painting, painting a photograph of a sculpture. So maybe we could... I have to think about it. Is it the appropriate... Time to eat. well maybe well, uh, yeah let's think about it Cool. So let's blow dry that.
here's where I am so far. Let's take a little bit of blue. This will turn into a bit of a brown. It's perfectly fine. Actually, really dark blue. That's, even, that's great, too. Dried. Let's uh, let's see. What do we need more of? Uh, let's get a cool. Let's use this cool blue.
Let's take a bit more cool red. I'm just going to blow dry this. I'm getting getting close here. Getting, getting getting close. Let's do the uh what was it orange I want to do next. Take some warm yellow.
let's do that. See, what's happened here is my blue and red have overlapped, and there's the yellow in behind, so it basically makes a black with those overlapping colors. Not a huge deal, but obviously makes a much darker line there than I really would have ever wanted. So, it's a little frustrating, but... I think I will survive. going to be close, but I just have a feeling that this won't kill me. Just trying to lighten that up a little bit. I think I might be making that worse. Now, do I wipe that away or just leave it like that? I think I gotta wipe that away. I might have put a bit more of a curve on those lines that maybe I should have, especially that one. But that's okay. Let's move on from this here. I'm going to blow dry that and then I'm going to do the rings.
Um, oh, there's Lolly says, <laughs> yes, Michael, nice planet, looking good. Um, Lolly says, either I look like an alien or my painting is very bad. Oh, doing a self-portrait, okay. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so now I want to put the shadow on the on the surface of Saturn being cast by the the um, the rings here. So I want to put this dark band going across here, basically a black. So let's take the black. Um, do I want to put it in with the blue? No, let's let's mix the black on its own here. Now, this, we want something that's fairly opaque, but maybe I do want to soften the edges out just a little bit. So the, the glazing fluid can help with that. So it might be worth just... Let's blow dry that. And notice how this one, unlike the other bands, goes right off to the edge and connects with the black of space there. Because unlike, it's not a, a stripe on the moon, or on uh, Saturn, it's the shadow from the, the um, rings, right? Just so you can kind of see how this is developing. In fact, I 
So you can see I, what I've been doing so far, just softening that edge, just so it's not so harsh. Let's blow dry that. So I want it, I want there to be kind of like it, it's as if it cuts right in here because it's so dark there in the shadow that that it appears to kind of join up with the sky in behind. In fact, I may even just take this just. That's pretty good. <laughs> the, um, this is why I like to try to blow dry that because you can probably even see the canvas is kind of it's like a bit of a whoop under here <laughs> where I've been blow drying. So it'll slowly go down as the as the mat cools. Um, can I use this black again? What if we... I was gonna maybe do a... No, yeah, I'm gonna add... No, no, no. I was thinking about mixing black into these colors, but I think I want to start with some white. So I'm going to take some white, mix this into my yellow here, my warm yellow. Let's just take a look at how I want to do these rings. So I'm going to fade them out as I get close to that side of the planet.
Okay, let's uh My concern right now isn't really colors, it's just shape at the moment. That was... So I must have kind of goofed on this line a little bit. It looks like it's tapering inwards when I don't want it to do that. So now I have just mixed a little bit of black into this mixture, which gives me a little bit of a gray. What I'm looking for here is a bit more opacity. Okay, actually, let me just put a blow dry that so I can paint over top of it.
So let's now take, let's take this red again. I like it's kind of a little bit, in fact, let's take a little bit of this darker color, make it a bit more of a brown. Maybe even put a bit of warm red in here, warm yellow. So I got a bit of warm red, warm yellow, cool red, and warm blue. So I've made a little bit of a, it's kind of got a little wide there, got a little bit, a little carried away.
see if it does look a little... I'm gonna have to see if I can kind of paint some of that out. Lolly says, is Pascal here? I wonder if he's in Paris. I, I think, was Pascal here earlier in the episode, I think? Wasn't he talking about uh, to boldly go where no man has gone before? I think he's here. He may, may not still be here, but he's he was here. <laughs> uh, do I want to do any more nuance in here? Like, let's say if we look at the original... You know, all of these are just, you know, hundreds of millions of tiny little rocks. So, how could I simulate that? Well, maybe little bits of just slight, like little dots, I think, might be kind of nice. So, let's get a small brush. Maybe let's mix up a paint first. Let's get a kind of, let's get a little bit of blue, perhaps. The same blue that we had here. Let's, uh, a little bit of glazing fluid. Let's get some blue. my white line that's why I tried to wipe some of that away I was kind of afraid that might happen but it's okay Try this, it's a little tacky. So this, I think, you know, we see these little bits of reflections in some rocks and things that are... Oh, 
well, they're some of these are like the size of our own moon. <laughs> I gotta widen. Oops. Some of them just aren't showing up too transparent. Okay, let's just take a quick look. I think that's that's good. I just want to do just a little bit more. Like, what could we do? Maybe a green?
take my black now. So I'm just kind of cleaning up the the space between the rings here, which you know, as I blended things out, they kind of got a little bit. They got very soft, which in general was fine, but uh, I think just a little bit of clarity back in here would be nice. glop of water that started to dissolve on the surface here I didn't even notice that ah there's another one there let's just see if I can Okay, so I think I'm ready to move on. There'll probably be a few little finishing touches. Okay, so I'm just gonna blow dry all of these little dots in there. I might have gone a bit overboard with that, but.
Oh, sorry. I forgot to mute the microphone there. That was probably a little bit loud. Sorry. <laughs> Sometimes I forget to unmute the microphone, and today I forgot to mute the microphone. I think it's been a while since I've done that. Usually I'm pretty good at muting the microphone. <sighs> Sorry. Of course, it was a nice long one, too. Ah, yeah, 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 mamma mia. Nikki says, hey, teacher, I'm a little late today. i just enjoying watching you painting like always. Yeah, you're the best. <laughs> uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, should we put him? Let's. Drink out of my daughter's mug. My number one dad mug. Right, every every dad needs a number one dad mug. <laughs> oh, our daughter went to uh, a well. It's a, I guess it's essentially a daycare, but um, she went from preschool to daycare. And it looks like a really cool place. Oh, her teach new teachers and things are so sweet. I feel so lucky. Okay, let's, um, okay, so now let's focus on painting Voyager 1, <laughs> the subject of today's painting. We spent a lot of time on the background, getting the the the, the, the just the space, the, the black of space in, and then we've spent a while on Saturn, and then the rings. Let's now paint the the probe itself. I keep saying satellite, but it's not a satellite; it's a probe because satellites just tend to orbit, right? So, um, let's look at. Let's just go right to here. Just think about our plan. Oops. So ideally what I want to try to do is, is make a gray, and I got still lots of black to do that, um, and put a, make it just a slightly warmer gray. So maybe adding just a little bit more you know, like warm blue or warm yellow or warm red into the mixture just to help kind of push it forward. Um, also using a little bit more white perhaps to kind of create a contrast um, with the black here. So you'll recall that we began with an underpainting here. And I'm trying to, let's see if we can if we can see anything so you can kind of see that texture right in there that's the the spacecraft there's one of the arms now there's one arm uh, the other one right down there there's the end of it right in here so it joins up so I can find these various different points so which way do I want to do this do I want to just sort of eyeball it Or do I want to trace it out? Tracing it out would, would be faster. And more accurate. Um, because 
because it's almost like if I just paint this by an eyeball it, it would probably turn out better than me trying to to match it back up. Let me think, what, how could I do this? So if I do that, reasonably confident. So it, it, just like normal graphite paper, it is the shiny side facing down. And I want to try to put as little pressure on the carbon paper as possible. I mean, with my, you know, obviously with the pencil, I want to put pressure on there, but as little pressure as possible with, like, I don't want to be holding my fingers down here over top of it. Now those larger lines
I think I'll do separately. What also you want to be careful like one reason I didn't put the tape on here is I didn't want any residue from the tape getting off onto the or peeling any tape off because that solid color it would be tricky to to kind of fix unless I have more I do have more but I put the tape over here because if there was a problem well I could probably kind of fudge that a little bit Like last time, I think I'm just gonna try to let's get a clean rag. Oh, I might have wiped a bit too much. Oh, hey, but that's okay. Okay, let's let's see a little bit here. Do I want to use a Posca pen? That would probably make my life a lot easier, wouldn't it? Slight discoloration here.
Ugh. It's muted. Ugh. How long was it muted for? That's the question. Um, that, by the way, is my little technique for getting a little bit sharper lines. This is kind of a little shimmy. Let's just take make a little bit of black, get a darker color here. Oops. Not so much at the moment worried about accuracy, so much as just getting some colors in place. The sun is coming from the right hand side. with a little bit more white.
Guess I didn't put any glazing fluid in there. Should have blow dried this up. <coughs> How often do you hear me say that? So I'm just sort of like lightening and darkening and lightening and darkening as I go.
I am kind of tempted to paint all of that out. I think I want to just do a little bit more lightning. <clears throat> you know, I think I want to lighten that up even more. I need I almost get want to get pretty close to white here.
Okay, so I'm going to continue around here. Let's take some of this white. It's not perfect white. It's got a little bit of gray in it, which I actually don't mind. In fact, I'll take a little bit more of it. So that way I can always do a little touch up here and there to make it even brighter. Let's blow dry that. Oops.
know if you can see, but I can see this right there texture wise shows that this is originally where this should have been. So you can see I'm a little, the whole shape is a little bit off. That's okay. That's okay. Just, it's just good to kind of just take a moment just to notice something like that. Maybe I should blow dry this before I move on to using it. So made a couple little marks on here, there, and there, showing where. Uh, okay, let's see. Can I do this? This is sort of backwards for me, and not the best idea to try doing something like this when it's backwards for me, but. Uh, Oops. I hope the internet's still working. I just got an error message. I hope, uh, I hope the stream hasn't just stopped suddenly. Ah, <laughs> oh, Lolly, you're the best. Thank you for assisting me there with um, mentions about the subscribers and all that stuff. That's awesome.
I'm going to get another gray. Let's take some more black. Oops, kind of put that in the wrong place, but uh, that'll be our little secret. <laughs> oh, there's the record right there. That's cool. I didn't even notice that until just now. Cool. Obviously, I've simplified things quite a lot. Let's um, let's put the other beams in. So I just, again, made a couple of tiny little marks that denotes that's where the original line was that I painted. So I'm going to blow dry this. Where's the... 
Is that it possibly going off the edge here? Um, let's go to this view again. Let's get some paint on the brush. Again, this is the the weakest way that I, I can do this. This is going kind of against my body. I would do it almost the opposite direction, but just for the purpose of the camera, it's a little bit awkward for me, but... Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's sort of like the most difficult way I could have gone about that, but uh Can I do this again in the opposite <laughs> uh, direction here? Let me see. Is that possible? Just double checking, triple checking that I am actually lining it up in the correct way so that I don't get across my. <gasps> what have I done? Why have I decided to do it this way? Ay, ay, ay.
I guess I could have just done it the most natural, non-awkward way, and you could just see. <laughs> Rather than me trying to do it the most awkward way I could find, but... Uh... story of my life. Always trying to find a difficult way to do things, Michael. Let's just take a look at that. <clears throat> okay, again, the I've I'm shading this a little bit different than the original because I'm thinking of the light kind of coming in from this side, right? That's how it's casting that shadow on Saturn from the, the rings, right? So light's coming from this side. It could even be a little bit lighter down there, but... Um, Let's blow dry this. I want to put some yellow in there next. Thank you. 
Oh, sorry, look at all these questions. Um, uh, sorry, Nikki, you left all these comments. Uh, where? Uh, Nikki says, Teacher, after a long time off, I finally finished one of my two paintings. Stopped for months, lol, and I will put it in your group later to see your feedback in the future about what you think. Absolutely, I'd love to see what you've been working on. I'm so proud of you for starting up again after taking a little bit of a break. Totally normal, right? Everybody needs a little bit of time off every once in a while, right? Especially with summer, it's been nice. Now it's getting into fall and it's going to start to snow and rain. And, uh, right? So it's kind of good to ramp back up into those indoor activities. Um, Nell says, a little late. I came to say hi. Also, you are amazing. Thank you, Nell. Nikki says, you are my art teacher who inspires me to always paint, even if I don't have time. I never give up. I love what I do, and everyone also likes to see my results. It's so satisfying. I have a question, please. I once painted the Superman logo, and I believe you even gave me feedback on it. But when I went to make the stars, it, I didn't like the result very much. You making this telescope reminded me about space. I always have difficulty painting space, stars, moons, etc. on canvas. Any advice, please? Because I always push it forward to do things about space. Ah, good questions. Okay. Um, uh, you know, this one, I think I'm going to keep the stars. Um, do I want to? I wasn't planning on painting stars. I don't. Th I could do. Um. I might. I might not though, because I I have done a few other episodes where I did paint the stars in the sky, like this. I think. I think all the other ones I've done with space, I've painted the stars. Um, I think just the one thing you want to do, instead of painting white stars or yellow stars, is to be very subtle. Because especially if you got a black background, you can just do very, like, almost, like, dark gray stars. Little white, little dots, little gray dots. Um, and then if you feel you need them to make them brighter, add a little bit more white and, and go over them again. Another thing you can do is to... Um, let's do it on the back of this book. By the way, this uh, Algernon Blackwood, oh, one of my favorite authors of all time, a uh, Canadian author from the 1800s. He's sort of like Canada's version of Edgar Allan Poe. Great stories. Uh, just randomly, what the the Windigo here is one of the best and this is a gift from my really good friend jesse who i just got a text from is just drove all the way across canada or to toronto from vancouver to toronto and spending the fall in kalamazoo michigan so he's just been blowing up my phone here saying just got into town good to see you got in safe job um Oh, yeah, so what was I going to do? I was going to paint on this, right? So let's say we do a star. You know, we might start with like a little dot like this. Like this is a this is the a dark gray that I used to paint in these dark areas, right? And then if you feel like you want it to be a little bit lighter, take an, another one. So what I did is just put a little lighter dot inside of a larger gray dot. And that gives it that effect that like that the sun is, or not the sun, or like it's, sun is a star, is, is kind of glowing. That there's, it's not just white, but there's a little bit of brightness around the edges. It's not the best example. Let me see if I'll just try it again here. So 
We start with that. That makes sense. So, and I've done that with many of, probably, I think this might be the only star painting I've done that may not have, or space painting without any stars. Because one thing is, is to perceive those stars, things have to be really, really dark. And probably to take this picture, everything was lightened up a lot, which is a whole long story with the, about, <laughs> um, exposure on cameras if you're interested in learning about exposure i've got a whole free photography course here on youtube which you're welcome to watch okay so we're missing a few little bits of gold on here So let's get that gold record on here. Let's say, let's take some cool yellow to start. There's our gold record. Now I might, I don't know. Actually, I was planning on adding some warm yellow on there, but let's just hold off just for a second. Let's just see. Mickey says, gotcha, teacher. Thank you, though. Uh, um, I hope I explained that well enough about doing those stars. Um, and I think you want them to be mostly small, but then you also want variety. You want some that are bigger and smaller. I think that would also help. That will give it, uh, Help make them look like some are closer, farther away, bigger or smaller. I think I am just gonna add a little bit of warm yellow. Because warm yellow is much closer to gold in terms of the way that it's perceived. Oops. Okay, so this is great. The one thing is, is there's a lot of gray. So what I want to do is I want to give it some pops of white, brighten that up. And what that's going to do is, is also give it, make it look like it's a little bit closer to us because it's so white. Everything else is kind of a little bit less uh, intense. Randy says, I like yours. It looks better. I was wondering, do you practice in your spacesuit preparing for your moon mission? <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, that's. I'm, I'm actually wearing my moon boots right now as we speak, Randy. <laughs> uh, great. I love it. Okay, so one thing I uh, what I'm doing here is sometimes 
if I when I wipe clean my brush off in the water, sometimes water is still on there, and then it starts to drip down, and then I get a little puddle on the canvas. So just trying to prevent that. So I'm just gonna continue to brighten. So I'm intending to show that these, the, the tops of those beams are getting hit by light, but the bottom part is kind of just hid with shadows, right? And a little bit of what I'm doing here is, is what um, Thomas Kincaid, like him or, or loathe him, I did an episode on Thomas Kincaid for Christmas the first year I was doing these streams. Um, and one of the things Thomas Kincaid was talking about was, um, always like you, you basically can't add enough white into your highlights. Just keep on painting, let it dry, paint it again, let it dry, paint it again. And that gives you those really bright pops of light. And there's a reason Thomas Kincaid called himself <laughs> the painter of light, right? The, that white really helps give it uh, some brightness.
Okay. There is obviously more stuff going on all over the place in this thing, but... Uh... My nose is just right hovering over top of this thing. I need to see it from further back. I think I can walk away. I mean, there's little things in the in the black that drive me nuts. I'm hoping as it dries, that will kind of not become such an issue. Um, is that good enough to walk away? Do I want to? I mean, I could keep on adding more and more and more white to try to brighten and brighten and brighten all of this up. You know what, I think... Okay, I think I should walk away. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm very happy with the way this one turned out. Definitely went in some directions I didn't expect, but that's kind of the joy of painting. It might not seem that way when you're painting. Sometimes you're like, oh, what? It's, everything's gone wrong. It's gone in a different direction than I wanted. But just think of it like a road trip. Sometimes you don't end up going on the highway you planned on because you want to take a side trip. You want to go see that, you know, roadside attraction or outlet mall or great, you know, natural view. And then it takes, then you end up going in a slightly different direction. And maybe you never end up at the destination you want. You end up somewhere else. And then is it better or worse than your original plan, right? If you're really in the moment, it probably is a better, uh, or at least very different, right? And different isn't bad, right? So let's um, just quick reminder to like subscribe hit the notification bell 70 to 60 60 to 70 percent of the people who are watching right now are not subscribed to the channel i don't know why you'd watch for four or five hours and not subscribe but that would be really helpful and if you want to support the channel with a small donation let's say 25 cents a dollar ten dollars to help to keep all the lights on so that I can do this week after week after week as I've been doing for the past three years plus, that would be awesome. I love doing this and I love helping the world learn how to express themselves better and better and better. I think we would have a much better world if we were all uh, had a positive outlet for our feelings. And so here's the original painting and there's my version. Clear out some of this space. <laughs> okay. Definitely turned out different than I was expecting. Um, you know, I, I heard Randy say, I think, you know, it looks good, better than the original or something, um, which is very flattering. Really when I hear that, especially in an image like this, is I've taken two different images that, that uh, you know, one was collaged into a different photo. So part of painting them is going to unify those two disparate images. 
adding a shadow or, or uh, highlights that also reflect the the um, the lighting situation on the planet the Saturn as well really helps because in the original the light is kind of coming from a different direction so it gives us a little bit of like uh, what? what's going on right so here it's this that helps integrate these two disparate images together is it a masterful job no <laughs> definitely not but I think it looks okay um, you know, just like with every painting I've done, I, I look at it and think like, ah, oh, I could do 10 times better if I did this again. And that's why I always encourage if you're if you're working, you know, often people are posting things on the Facebook and say, I wish, uh, you know, I'm not so happy with this. It's like, just try painting again. I guarantee it's going to turn out better because you're going to take all the things you learned first time around and apply them in the new version. Okay, how about let's, uh, where should we zoom into first? Well, let's we'll zoom into the, this helps give me the scale that we're zooming into. Okay, and how about let's start with the rings. We'll go to the rings of Saturn. My rings are a little bit brighter than the original image. Um, and I bet you though that's also been brightened up quite significantly in the computer. I mean, we are talking millions of miles away from the sun. So, so some of that those are going are existing in very dark dark shadow so i've kind of amplified them a little bit it again it's also important to remember that this is brighter about 15 20 percent brighter than it actually is um you know i did all these little dots i mean yeah a bunch of them i, I could have maybe omitted them but they're just intended just to kind of maybe little pops highlights of light reflecting off certain uh, larger rocks so now let's go to Jupiter or not Jupiter Saturn itself um, obviously some of the striping is I've just taken some liberties there we can see underneath that yellow remember that was the imprimatura and then I put my blue I basically painted the whole thing a cool blue and right here is where instead of letting it you know blow drying it I kept painting and it pulled some of that paint off however despite how upsetting and frustrating that is it does now give it a little bit more nuance that if it was just a f totally flat shape it might have or not flat like just consistent blue it might have looked more like a beach ball so here now that starts to appear maybe is that a land mass and then some kind of I don't know a helium or nitrogen uh you know ocean or something surrounding it so you know I, as i said that's feel like to, for me is like the definition of of the uh happy accident as bob ross used to say i mean so here what i mean i didn't even, i was i did notice that but i forgot to kind of think about it or paint it like what is that those vertical or diagonal almost vertical uh, lines I'm pretty sure are not in the original image those are probably scan lines from the video camera or on there um, again you can see all these little this texture kind of coming through I think that actually kind of works maybe instead of it being straight maybe they could have been a little bit more curved because they do kind of counteract the the shape of the planet in the same way that the original photograph does so but it's you know this is a okay so what we see here for instance is the benefit of having a little bit of a texture on the canvas that we see the little bit you know the weave of the canvas some of the brush strokes and by glazing over top of that it actually brought it out 
And so it gives it, you know, rather than just big solid areas, if I was painting on glass or like a super smooth paper or um, like a mylar or some sort of um, uh, glassine, some sort of like plastic uh, paper, where this would have just been very smooth, it wouldn't have any of that texture, which is fine, but I kind of it kind of works a little bit, right? It's the same reason that you know some some people when they draw like to use a sketchbook that has a very textured surface. Again, I think all that works. Maybe I could have gone a little bit closer to the edge, especially at the top here where it should be much darker. That could have I could have you know, um, darkened that there, um, but it's okay. I, I don't think that's it's, the world's going to come to an end because of that omission. And then we've got Voyager One there. Looks like so that little bit of that's a texture from when I originally painted in my underpainting. So you could see that little bit of highlight. You know, maybe we'll just say that's a different, that's, maybe that's Earth. That's a little, that's Earth. <laughs> Way back there, that little reflection. Um, so there's obviously lots of detail in the, in these armatures, these big beams. This, by the way, is about the size of a, of like a big car, like a SUV. It's, it's pretty big. Um, and so... You know, that's probably too small of a ladder to crawl around on, but, um, you know, I would say probably that's about the length of a human being there, I would imagine, right? Um, you know, there are some inconsistencies, you know, like that, I don't know, reflector or whatever, you know, should have been there. Mm. Only a few people are going to notice that. Um... I really like, you know, that little bit of yellow I think is nice, and I love I, that the record can be seen there. I think that's cool. Um, and then just lastly, these kind of straight lines here that I showed you how to do that with a ruler. Um, I didn't do the best job because I was sort of doing it upside down and backwards with, and not able to put my head in, get my head in the way so that you could see it. But I think actually it turned out pretty good. I was a little like, oh, not turn out the way I want. But uh, um, had I wanted something thinner, that would have been a bit of a problem. Because I did paint it a little bit, you know, wider. And then kind of went and widened the whole rest of it. From In, in this instance, I think it worked well. But it, it could have... I, I should probably have just done it the right way. <laughs> So I don't have to make excuses for myself. Or maybe that's why I did it. Okay. That's cool. I like those colors a lot. And I'm, I'm glad. I can't remember who it was who was encouraging me to just to... to keep those colors maybe it was it was Lisa did you say that I like the colors the, the greens and the blues I was going to go for much more of a brownish uh, orangey tan colors which is the way I think of Saturn in my mind and I'm glad you encouraged me to stay with closer to the original If I was just offered a little bit of a criticism to myself, I think, you know, the it might have even have been worthwhile actually cutting a piece of paper out, because it does look like that top, like so that this would start to curve in. No minor, super minor quibble, but uh, I could quibble with my own artwork all day long. Um, Lisa says, turned out really good, I think. Nikki says, looks better than the original. And Kathy says, looks so great. Well, thank you, everybody, for painting along with me today. I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening or morning, afternoon, wherever you are. 
on our beautiful planet Earth, that pale blue dot floating out there all by itself in space, uh, just like Voyager 1, billions and billions of kilometers away, exploring interstellar space. Hopefully one day we all get to go and follow the in the in the what's the footsteps <laughs> of voyager the the you know, the interstellar trail that it's uh, been blazing since the 70s uh, i who wonders wonder what it will eventually encounter you know thousands hundreds of millions of years from now when it finally crashes into a planet I wonder what they'll think when they play that record. Our civilization will probably be long gone by then. Um, you never know, though. Maybe maybe we'll get our, our act together and we won't blow each other up. <laughs> Fingers crossed, everybody. <laughs> okay, we'll see you guys very soon. Enjoy the rest of your evening. We'll talk to you soon. Good night, everybody.